I'm Amy and this is A Star Reads and it's time for the next round of my battle of the children's picture books. So I am currently taking a children's literature course and through this course I'm getting to read a ton of picture books. And so I thought it'd be fun to take the books I'm reading each week and rank them. Rank them, I'm doing eight each week, well every week that I get a chance to do this, ranking them from my least favorite of the books that I read that week all the way up to the one that I thought was the best. And then at the end of this whole process I'm gonna take whatever winners I had for each week and rank those. So at this point, it looks like it might be seven books that I'll be ranking. I was hoping for eight to keep it consistent, but I, I had a week where I couldn't really work on this. So let's just get started. I'm gonna start with book number eight. And this week that's gonna to go to The Hole by Oyvind Torsetter. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but uh, this is how it's spelled. And this is an engineered book. So what's interesting about this one is that there is this hole that goes through it all the way through to the other side. And this hole plays a big part of the story throughout the whole book. I really thought this was a charming story. I liked the art well enough. It was cute. And what was really fun about this was that any page you turn to, you're gonna find some way that the hole interacts with the story. It wasn't anything that was overly spectacular for me, but I can see kids having fun seeing the progression of this whole and how it plays a part in the story. And I recommend it, especially if you are looking for more engineered books. I thought this was a clever concept and it's not like anything that is crazy as far as like there's a whole bunch of pop-ups or anything like that. But what was really cool was how it interacted with each and every page of this book. This was translated from Norwegian. And I do think it's very important for students to have opportunities to read books from different countries because it gives different perspectives and you get to see different uh, concepts that are popular in different places. So I know this was actually a very popular book. And so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, check out the whole. All right, book number seven. I'm gonna go with The Oldest Student, How Mary Walker Learned to Read by Rita Lorraine Hubbard. And the Caldecott Honor winner, Oge Mora was the one who did the illustrations in this. And what's really neat about the illustrations in this is they were created with collage. So here's like a really good example of how you can see the collage. You can see that they used newspapers and they layered different um, pieces of paper on top of each other to create the shapes. And I just thought that the artwork and the color scheme and how it worked well with this historical nonfiction book was, it was very clever and it was beautifully done. I can see this being a very important book for lessons in history, especially when it comes to emancipation and the period where there was like the Great Migration and Jim Crow era and just how much people who were enslaved struggled after emancipation because they weren't given any resources to be able to continue on their life. So in this story, Mary Walker always, always when she was a child and she was an enslaved person at that time, she really wanted to learn how to read, but it took her until she was like in her 90s because of just the way her life went. And so this story is basically about how you're never too old to learn something new. I really enjoyed it. The story itself was not presented as enthrallingly, <laughs> that's not a word, is it? <laughs> as maybe I would have liked, especially considering you're sharing this with students. And so that's why it wasn't higher up on my list, but I did really enjoy this and I do see so much value in this book and I recommend it. Next, for book number six, this is a completely different type of book even. And this is Stand Up, Speak Up, a story inspired by the climate change revolution by Andrew Joyner. And this is a nonfiction sort of, like it's nonfiction inspired, but really this is a book about social justice and teaching young people how to use their voice to stand up for the things they believe in. And it's poetic in the sense that there are only words like, wake up, signs up, it's all like rise up. Every single section is about something up, something up, stand up, speak up, rise up, you know? And so that was very clever. I did like it. I didn't think it went maybe as in depth as I would have liked it to, but for being an introduction for children into social justice and being able to stand up for the things they believe in, I thought this did a really good job. I did enjoy that we got to follow this main character and see her own experiences and how things can be frustrating, but how she rises up. She actually creates a program where she is doing things to cause change in her community. And so I loved that. And in the back of this, which is really cool, it shows individual little stories about many different young people who have made some kind of change for climate change or just 
in social justice in general. And I love that because it gives children an opportunity to see people like them who have wanted to see change and that they were actually able to make change. And I just, uh, clever. It's just so clever, so well done by this author. And I did really enjoy this. It's a very quick read. So I think that this is something that you could easily get through with your children or your students. It's inspirational, which we could all use right now. <laughs> Book number five is A Sick Day for Amos McGee, written by Philip C. Stead and illustrated by Aaron Eastead. And this one is a pretty popular book. I, I've heard about this one before. I hadn't read it before this. It's a Caldecott winner and I know a lot of people absolutely love this. So I wanted to pick it up and see what all the hype was about. The illustrations are interesting because the colors are very muted, but they give it this sort of antique feel to it. And it's about this guy named Amos who works at the zoo, but he works in a position where he's actually kind of supporting the animals, like uh, giving them what they need to be happy. So he's not like a caregiver so much as like feeding them and taking care of the poop and stuff. He's more like, supporting them by being their friend and by playing games with them and stuff like that. And it was really sweet. But then when Amos gets sick, it's really fun to see the reaction of the animals. And this was heartwarming. It was charming. It was a very mellow book. So it's not anything that's going to blow your socks off, but it will make you feel here in the heart. <laughs> and I really did like it, actually. I really thought it was great. And I thought this was really relaxing. This is the kind of book you read when there's a little bit of quiet time needed. And you can just read this nice, gentle book with your students or with your children. And I think that they'll get some pleasure out of it. So book number four was actually an historical fiction and I was excited about this one because I really love lighthouses and this is called Hello Lighthouse by Sophie Blackall and she's a Caldecott medalist for her artwork and her artwork in this is gorgeous. Of all the books today this is probably my second favorite of the artwork. I thought that the work that Black All did in this was so beautiful. And it was nice to get a chance to read a historical fiction within my picture book groupings because I haven't really read that many. And this one is about a young man back in the day when lighthouses needed to be attended regularly. So someone would live in the lighthouse and they would either live there by themselves, they'd have a helper, or sometimes they would bring their family. It's a subject matter that is very interesting to me. So I think that maybe this would work for some people. It might not work for all people. Each page was like part of this big poem. It wasn't a very narrative style of writing. It was more poetic. And I thought that worked too, especially for younger readers because it's not too complicated. I think that this one really won me out because of the artwork. The artwork was so darn beautiful. And of course, being a subject matter that I enjoy. So book number three is so darn cute. I couldn't help but love this book. And it's a very simple book. It's not too in depth but it was clever and it was just, I mean, it was just adorable. Let's just be honest, it was adorable and I couldn't help myself. So I'm gonna go with Diary of a Wombat by Jackie French and Bruce Watley. And this is set in Australia and it's about a wombat. <laughs> He's so cute. He's just so cute. Let me see if I can find a good picture. So in this book, we have our little wombat friend and really it's kind of set up like this almost every day where he has a schedule and you're reading his schedule of what his life is like. And this wombat has a pretty standard wombat life until people move in to his habitat and he has to learn how to live with the people and the people have to learn how to live with the wombat. And I really liked this look at this wild animal that some people could consider a menace. And just the way the interactions between the wombat and the humans worked out, it was really so cute. And the illustrations were adorable. And I couldn't help but be utterly charmed by this book. Another thing I like about this book is that it talks about wombats. And granted, this is not a nonfiction, so you're not getting accurate, in-depth information about wombats. But I think it's fun to hear about the experience that this author is writing about with these animals that are endemic to Australia and Tasmania, which means that you're not gonna find these animals anywhere else in the world. So for children who are not in Australia and Tasmania, it's a great opportunity to learn something new and get to see this cute creature that they may know nothing about. All right, book number two. This one was just, stunning. The artwork maybe wasn't my favorite artwork of all the books that I've seen today, but I thought that the story was very important. And this is actually a nonfiction. It is The Catman of Aleppo. And this is by Irene Latham and Karim Shamsi Basha. And it was illustrated by Yuko Shimizu. What's important about this story is this happens after the all the warfare that happened in Syria a few years ago. A lot of people were able to escape Syria when all these things were happening. It was horrible. It was scary. It was dangerous. But some people did end up staying and trying 
trying to rebuild the communities and Allah was one of them and the the home that he was used to the Syria that he was used to was never the same after these wars but he wanted to do whatever he could to protect and preserve what he had loved so much about his city of Aleppo so while he is doing everything he can to help the people within the community he also notices there's so many stray cats because people who were leaving couldn't take their pets with them. And he started feeding them. He used all the money he could, all the money he had to start taking care of these cats. And this is really about his humanitarian effort to help these cats. But then that expanded and he was able to help people within his community. And it just, I think it's a very important story. I think it's important because it shows the side of Syria that we don't get to hear in the news every day. And it shows how much the people of Aleppo love their city, love their country. I thought it was beautiful. I highly recommend it. I think it's an important way to get into subject matter that is important for children to understand because we only hear certain things from the news and it's usually negative, but there are some really amazing and inspiring stories that we should be hearing about instead. All right, so book number one is a book I'm so excited about. It came out really far ahead in the pack this week. Like it was, a, it was, this is a favorite for sure. This is a beautiful, beautiful book. The artwork is unbelievably stunning and the writing was just gorgeous. I was so impressed. And that's actually kind of surprising too because this is a translated book. So the fact that it was translated in such a way that the writing really shone through, it was, it was incredible. And that book is The Day Saida Arrived and that was done by Susana Gomez Redondo and the illustrator was Sonia Wimmer. Wimmer? I'm not sure. When they translated this, they changed the main country to be the US, but this young character actually is in Spain and she's from Spain. And this is our character from Morocco. So like, I, I would be interested to read the original one in Spanish because I'm pretty sure that everything is thinking about Spain as being the country that this young character immigrated to, but in this book, they've changed everything so it's the US, I think to appeal to an American audience. But yeah, it, it was that was a little strange. That was maybe the one point that I was like, well, why didn't they just keep it as Spain? But you know, oh well. So this is a very poetic and beautiful lyrical writing style. In the beginning of this, every section starts out with the day Saida arrived. And then it kind of talks about some of the things that this character is observing with our character Saida, who's come from Morocco. Doesn't speak any English or in the original book case, Spanish whatsoever. And this character is really trying to figure out a way for them to become friends and, and understand more about not only what Saida is struggling with, but also how they can communicate best and how they can help each other communicate best. I loved that there were different parts in here with Arabic writing and the celebration of language in general was stunning. It was a celebration of Saida learning English, but it was also a celebration about our little character here learning Arabic because they were kind of teaching each other during this whole process. And the artwork, the artwork was just, it was just too much. Like it was too much. Like the incorporation of these little bits of Arabic and then language throughout the book, the way they incorporated the language through this was just beautiful. So you actually get the opportunity to learn Arabic words and it gives the words in English. There isn't any actual Spanish in this, even though it was translated from Spanish. It was very heartwarming. You get to see this beautiful relationship forming between these two characters. And I, I don't know, I just loved everything about this. I thought that there were so many wonderful points to this that I think would be great in teaching to children. It's a realistic fiction book, but because of the way it's written, how lyrical it is, and because of the art style, it feels like a fantasy, even though it's not really a fantasy. And so it just, I'm, I'm just a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. If you get a chance to pick this one up, do so because I love this book. So that's it for this week, the eight books that I have read. I'm really excited about the winner. And if you've read any of these, let me know in the comment section down below what you thought about them. I know that some of these were really popular, so I hope I didn't upset anybody. I liked all of them. Just know that. It's just that I have to rank them because <laughs> that's the way the video goes. Doesn't mean I didn't like any of the other ones. Just means that that was kind of the order in which I enjoyed them in. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you can see what happens with my sixth week of the Battle of the Children's Picture Books. We're getting close to the end. We're getting to the point where I might have to do a final battle soon and I'm getting really nervous and excited about it. <laughs> Thank you so much and I will see you later.